Well, thank you, everybody. Um, what I'm going to be uh, demonstrating today uh, are some of the techniques, basically the cliff notes of uh, this one water painting that I did um, a couple of years ago, which was actually um, on the cover of Watercolor Artist Magazine a little while back. Um, and I wanted to begin by talking about some of the materials that I use. So, um, obviously most of you know that the, your brushes come in natural and synthetic um, variants. And um, the, the best of the natural um, brushes are going to be your Kalinske Sables. Uh, the American Sable, the Martyr, is also a good um, brush. And recently, Princeton Brush Company has come out with a new um, synthetic that they're a little hyperbolic about it. They say it rivals um, the uh, Kalinsky Sables. But this series um, it is uh, 4850 is a very, very fine synthetic brush. I don't get any endorsement from this um, uh, for, for the money. They sent me a bunch of these, and when I tested them out, I like them very much. I also have some other brushes. I have this old, original uh, Sepler Gold Series 1 with the long handle. That's a very good synthetic brush. Um, I also use brushes like this on a regular basis, not today, but I wanted to just show you um, how I do this. And I used a brush larger than that three inch flat, which is just a chip brush that you could buy for a couple of bucks um, for painting the sky on this painting here. And the actual painting is, is is really um, smaller than it's reproduced in the, the book. And basically, what I was doing there was um, was um, masking the whole area off. And then once you've got the mask, you can just come in here and with a couple brush strokes lay in the paint. That's why I also have these larger palettes that I have here. Uh, I use these for, uh, for putting in these large washes. So, I'm going to um, begin by just doing a, a bit of a drawing. Just a quick little, nothing too fancy. I'm going to take my T-square. Did you say what kind of paints you were using? Yeah, that's, uh, and, and anybody who has questions, just ask away. Um, the paints that I'm using are going to be uh, several different brands. There isn't one brand where I endorse every uh, color. I have a lot of Windsor Newton, but lately I've been using uh, M. Graham paints. If you're not familiar with them, they're a small company out west. They make a limited line of paint, but it's a sufficient line of paint. And all things being equal, um, a lot of times they can be a, a, a superior um, uh, product to the Windsor Newton paints. What is the um, name? M. M. Graham. I've got tubes of it here. So they are sold locally. Uh, Dick Wick has them. Yeah, they do. So, um, so and we have a. Uh, I teach um, painting at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and we have a Dick Wick store in the building. And um, in that Dick Wick store, they will sell a tube of Windsor Newton Cerulean Blue and a tube of M. Graham Cerulean Blue. This is five milliliters. This is fifteen milliliters. This costs a dollar more than this. So, I mean, you can just figure it out. Uh, the other thing about the M. Graham paints that I like is that they have honey in them. So they stay malleable um, longer. Um, I, uh, I take a group of students to uh, Bermuda every uh, May, and we go plein air painting. And one of the things I have discovered is in a humid environment like Bermuda, uh, the honey starts to uh, leak out of these caps. So you have to be careful that you uh, don't have the paint all over you. But it, it is a, a really um, a, a good brand of paints. Um, there are a couple exceptions to uh, colors. I really do not like uh, M. Graham's um, Brawl Plumber. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever talked to you or if you've discovered uh, that when you're talking about your paints, that um, you've got uh, paints that are um, made up of single pigments and of uh, compound pigments. Uh, American Journey has a lot of paints that have compound pigments. They could have as many as four or five different pigments in there. And at the same time, you may have heard that people say, um, if you mix your paints too much, they're going to go muddy. Well, neither one is really completely true, but there are some truths that we can come from, uh, glean from that. One of them is that um, we can take 
all things being equal with watercolor, uh, we can take um, and mix uh, two colors uh, three different ways. We can uh, say we'll take a red and a yellow. All things being equal, the same amount of water, same amount of pigment. Mix them on your uh, palette and you put it on the paper, that's going to give you one orange. You put the yellow down first and the red down second, it's going to give you a slightly different orange. We'll, I'll discuss why that is in a moment. And then vice versa. So um, the color on top is going to read first. All things being equal. So um, that's one of the keys that my students uh, do when they're doing their portrait uh, work. We can actually be using things like um, cerulean blue and, and, um, and cobalt blue and things like that to get some of the initial shadows and then finish with these warmer colors and get this kind of really complex uh, kind of nuanced look to the portraits. Any other questions? This scene that I'm going to be reproducing is um, based on a scene in Bermuda, and the area is called Harrington Sound. And if you've ever been, if you've ever been to Bermuda or seen a, a map of Bermuda, um, Bermuda looks like a big fish hook, and the Harrington Sound would be kind of the loop. So I've got a couple simple um, lines that I put in here. I've got um, I've got my cloud formation here. I've got a little bit of a landmass in the uh, middle ground, a little bit of a landmass in the background. By the way, um, when you're uh, a little bit of PVC will um, you make you a, a nice little um, uh, tilt for your board. The idea with watercolor is that you're going to be using um, gravity to facilitate the brush stroke. One of the things that um, I am always telling my students is that um, when it comes to the nature of your paints, um, watercolor will allow you a more direct relationship with the nature of the pigments than any other medium. And um, the, your, your pigments are going to have uh, properties that are going to be well beyond uh, the properties of the color. Some of your paints stain, some of your paints uh, granulate. There are all kinds of things. There's relative tinting strength. There is the uh, mass tone. Mass tone is the color of the paint and its value of the paint in its most concentrated form. So something like a Prussian blue can actually be darker than uh, any of your store-bought blacks, but then you can thin it down to make a very nice sky blue. All those things are, are really important, and including the fact of whether the paint is opaque or not. The idea of transparent watercolor is kind of a misnomer, because the pigments remain the same regardless of the medium. What changes is the vehicle. And in oil, it's going to be either linseed oil or walnut oil or something like that. In acrylic, it's going to be a polymer. In a watercolor, it's going to be some type of gum, usually gum arabic, and some type of uh, sugar water, usually glycerin, but it can be hydromel, it can be honey, it can be all of the above. There's one other thing that's key in a difference between oil painting and watercolor painting. Um, in oil painting, the solvent that you use is not part of the vehicle, but in watercolor, the solvent that you use, water, is also part of the vehicle. So water control is key to doing a successful watercolor. So the first thing I'm going to start doing, I've got this um, dioxazine violet. I'm going to put that down along the horizon line. And then I am going to start to do a graded wash by just adding more water. Now, if you look carefully at my water container, one of the things you'll notice is that I've got the water filled right up to the top, and that's because I'm using my thumb and my, uh, my pinky as a stop so that I'm making sure that I'm getting just enough water and not too much. I know some people say that you shouldn't use a hair dryer on your watercolors. Have you ever heard that? And then when, when asked why you shouldn't use a hair dryer on your watercolors, people will tell you that, um, well, it changes how the color looks. Well, of course, all watercolors experience a value shift when they dry. That's why you have the old saying, if it looks right when it's wet, it's wrong.
When I'm doing a demonstration, because I'm going to be moving a little bit faster than I typically would be doing um, in my own studio, I may be doing some things that I wouldn't recommend that any of you do. Um, one of the things that I typically do is when I am um, attaching my paper to the board, I like to, uh, uh, if I'm wet stretching it or dry stretching it, if I'm wet stretching it, I let the paper relax. And lately what I've found is that a cookie sheet is uh, more than enough um, uh, water. You don't need it uh, a lot of water. Let the paper relax, put it down on the board, and then staple it first if you're doing it wet, and then tape if you want. If I'm just dry stretching it, then I just cut it and put it on the board and, and, then, and then make sure that I'm running staples one right after the other. Okay, I'm going to grab some blue for the sky. I have some cerulean blue and um, some cobalt blue and some ultramarine blue. Now, um, I don't know how much you are aware of the color index name that will be on the back of your paints, but if you're not familiar with it, it's something that I strongly recommend you become familiar with. When you buy a tube of paint, it will say something like cobalt blue or cerulean blue or something like that, and it may or may not be the actual paint that they're telling you it is. Um, true cerulean blue has a color index name, it's an alphanumeric code that's going to be P for P, B for blue, and then a number, and the number happens to be for cerulean blue uh, 35. The number has no significance, it was just assigned to the paint by the American Society for Testing Materials. The reason this is important is that there are a lot of companies that will make something they call cerulean blue, and what they do is they take phthalo blue and they mix it with white. Well, cerulean blue um, has a weak tinting strength, it's opaque, and um, it's easily liftable. Thalo blue has a, a very high tinting strength, and um, it is staining. So if you're trying to exploit all the different properties of your paint, beginning with knowing exactly what the paint is that you're utilizing is really important. The more you know about the nature of your paints, the more easy it is for you to... So what's the identifying um, code if it were phthalo and white? So in phthalo, when, when, it, when you look on the back of the tube um, where it's phthalo, it's going to say PB15, and sometimes you'll see a colon and then a 1, 2, or a 3. That is a distinction without a difference. It's just a slight variation in the chemistry. And then usually uh, PW... Um, Six for uh, titanium white, PW4 for, um, for uh, zinc white, and PW5 for barium white. I'm making, mixing this paint carefully because I want a nice thick um, amount of the color put down. One of the things you might be noticing here is that I have mixed the paint so thickly that it really is uh, its not running at all. This is affording me more control and it's giving me enough value. Now, because of the color that I've put down there, the properties in this color, I'm going to be able to come back in a little while and soften these edges a couple different ways. Um, and we'll talk about more about that in a minute. that I have in my paint box here today, with one or two exceptions, are single pigment paints. 
and that's going to allow me to maintain more control over the process as I go along. Uh, notable exceptions are going to be sepia, which is a compound color. Um, the traditional sepia was cuttlefish ink, and we don't use that anymore. And, um, and the hooker's green. And um, hooker's green, so named after Joseph Hooker, who was a, a botanist, the head of Kew Gardens, and was an amateur uh, watercolor painter. And he wanted something that would be um, good for him to, uh, to do some of the flowers that he was seeing in Kew Gardens. So he came up with this uh, color, which was a combination at the time of Prussian blue with gamboge. Um, it has since, the recipe has since changed. Uh, there was a color that had been introduced in the early um, 20th century called Hooker's Green, which was PG-8, and that was kind of like a savanna green. It was almost a black. And lately, the, the color combination has been a, a combination of a certain type of phthalo green mixed with some yellow. At one point, it was, um, it was, uh, PO49, which is um, quinacridone gold. But quinacridone gold, unfortunately, is not available anymore. Quinacridone gold, for those of you who can't picture what that looks like, it was the color of gold cars back in the 70s and the 80s and the 60s. That color that you saw on AMC cars was quinacridone gold. We can't remember that far back. <laughs> okay. We weren't born yet. <laughs> By the way, uh, please do as I say, not as I do. Don't splash paint all over your watercolor. Sounds like my mother. <laughs> so my first um, application was a graded wash. My next application was uh, a flat wash, albeit with a lot of pigment in it. And then I've done another uh, graded wash, and I'm going to let that all set up for a second. When you're laying your washes in, one um, step that I haven't done today, but I recommend that you do, is take your brush, wipe it off, so that it's damp, and then run it along the bottom of your board like this, so you pick up the excess paint as it's running down uh, on your board. Now this little line that has just showed up here because I was being a little sloppy, um, I used to when I was doing demonstrations, if something like that happened, I would think, oh, that's terrible. But it's not terrible because I can show you how to fix it. Now, think about this. When I first put that color down, some of you might have been thinking, oh my god, that's a lot of blue that he's putting down. But can you see how much it has uh, shifted? The value has shifted. Now, understanding the nature of your pigments will allow you to manipulate them um, in endless ways. And um, one of the things that um, I like to tell my students about is, um, just think about this for a second. Prussian blue is one of the darkest colors. In, in fact, it probably is the darkest color that you can buy. It has a, a very high tinting strength. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. Um, and it's highly staining. Um, cerulean blue um, is an opaque color. Opaque colors uh, vary less in their appearance from their mass tone, what they look like most concentrated, to their undertone, what they look like when they've been thinned down with a lot of water. Um, it has a very weak tinting strength and it is easily liftable. It is not staining. It is the opposite of staining. So the tinting strength is how much in an oil painting how much material you need to either tint white paint or to tint black paint. In a watercolor, we're not typically working with too much white, um, though we can. And, um, and so tinting strength in watercolor is best described as the paint's relative ability to affect another paint. 
So um, Prussian blue has a very high tinting strength. Cerulean blue has a very weak tinting strength to the point of if I were to mix one part cerulean blue with one part Prussian blue, the resulting mixture is going to look still just like Prussian blue. However, because it's 50% cerulean blue, I've just made a Prussian blue which is no longer staining, which can be easily liftable, and that's key when you're painting clouds like this. So in the uh, do as I say, not as I do department, don't do that. <laughs> So, here we've got the uh, cerulean blue, which is, as you can see, is easily lifting. There's the cerulean blue mixed with the cobalt blue, and mixed with the ultramarine blue. Ultramarine colors are notable for one characteristic that is different from any of the other colors. That is that they, um, they bleach with a weak acid. Um, Incidentally, does anybody know the difference between Prus uh, uh, French ultramarine and regular ultramarine? No. There is no difference. Oh. Okay? So French ultramarine, English ultramarine, ultramarine blue shade, red shade, they're all the same paint. When you look on the back of the tube, it's going to say pigment blue PB29. It's all the same. Don't trust these people. They want your money. But it has to be correct on the tube. It has to be correct on the tube. Now, if you see the word hue on a tube of paint, just replace that word with the word fake. What they're saying is that it's cadmium red. No, it's not. So, you can see that I'm, I, I could soften these edges endlessly. We can continue to do that. But there's something else that happens. Remember that I said that um, Opaque colors, and remember there's a lot of cerulean blue in this mixture, opaque colors vary less in their appearance from their undertone to um, their mass tone, which means that if I come along here and drop a little water along this edge here, I can then pick up some of this paint and drop it in here, and get the paint to migrate into the cloud and because the paint is opaque, it gives you a fudge factor. It's not to, going to give you a little line that you would otherwise have if you did it with um, some of these staining paints that have a dark mass tone. So if you're trying to figure out how do I paint clouds like this, it's with those two techniques. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some more of that um, dioxazine violet and mix it with a little brown. One of the things that um, most people know that linear perspective is what we artists use to create the um, illusion of a three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional plane. In uh, linear perspective, if we went down to the beach and saw where the sky met um, the uh, water, we would know that that's the horizon line. But does anybody know where it is in this room? It's eye level. That's right. Remember, I said it's an optical illusion, so it's your eye level. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create the illusion of parallel lines. They're not parallel at all. They're pointed at an angle, either pointing up if they're below your eye level or down if they're above your eye level. Another type of perspective is aerial perspective. Aerial perspective, sometimes called atmospheric perspective. That is the effect that atmosphere has when we're observing something. So with linear perspective, if I walk a block away from here, you're going to be able to close one eye and cover me up with your thumb. With atmospheric or aerial perspective, what happens there is that if I'm wearing a white shirt and black pants, my white shirt is going to look uh, darker and my black pants are going to look lighter. 
as I walk off into the distance. So as I'm painting this distant shore here, I don't want to have a wide range of color and value there. I want to have a very limited range of color and value. I'm going to save the uh, stronger color and value for um, up in the middle ground and the foreground. While I'm drying this, I want to talk a little bit about composition. In a realistic uh, watercolor painting, um, we've got basic drawing and composition. And of the two, composition is the most important. Some people may be surprised to hear that, but that is in fact the case. And one of the things that I'm doing in this particular painting, because I want to emphasize the water as I'm resorting to a, a vertical format because I want to have a lot of reflection that's going on in here. And um, I've got, the, anytime you use a, a rectangle, you're going to be uh, beginning to um, create um, <coughs> eye movement in your painting. A square is going to impede eye movement. A, a rectangle is going to begin to um, encourage eye movement, whether it is horizontal or, in this case here, vertical. And then it's the vision of space. So where I put the um, where I put the uh, horizon line is about one third down from the top, leaving two thirds for the remaining area. If you divide your painting in thirds, both right and left and, and up and down, those points of intersection, especially if you draw a diagonal, all the lines would meet in four spots, sometimes referred to as aesthetic spots. These are spots where if you put something of relative import in your painting, it's going to give it more uh, weight than it otherwise would. That's why this cloud is about one-third in from the left. Once I go through some of the basics of the painting and we get something established, then if time allows, then I will go back in with more nuance a little bit later on. The next color that I'm going to grab is going to be um, the aforementioned Hooker's Green. In my paint box, I've got my brushes, I've got my pencils, I also have eyedroppers, and um, they're just so that I can mix uh, volumes of paint, um, larger volumes of paint. Another thing that I've been using lately is this new type of atomizer that um, was actually originally designed for uh, people who cut hair. But what it does is it, once you pump it a couple times, it gives you a steady stream of uh, water and it's not concentrated in one area. It's, uh, I found it when I'm doing a lot of wet into wet to be very useful. What? The atomizer. Well, the, I don't, the, I can show you one on, on uh, my phone, but I don't know what they call it. Where is it available? Um, Amazon will have it. Beauty Supply. Beauty Supply will have it, but Amazon will have it. Um, I mentioned it to um, this year's, um, uh, this semester's uh, class, and um, a lot of them went and just ordered it on Amazon and had it the next day. that's still wet, I'm going to come in here and put some additional darks in there. Is that a black that you're putting in? It's a very dark. The very dark color that I put down along here, the, the initial color is the uh, hooker's green. Then the color that I put into it is a mixture of sepia with a little Prussian blue. I don't use store-bought blacks. I mix my blacks according to where I happen to be painting. The um, last article that I wrote for um, Watercolor Artist 
was called Portraits of Places, and it was paintings of New York, Philadelphia, Venice, and Bermuda. And the blacks that I use in those four locations are going to be uh, different, especially Venice and Bermuda. New York and Philadelphia, similar um, um, blacks. In it. And I, I always mix the colors. And the easiest way to mix a, a black is to take um, two colors that um, are complementary colors. If the color has a dark mass tone, it's probably transparent. Not always, but most of the time. And um, think about quinacridone gold. If you, when you, when you squeeze it out of the tube, it looks very, very dark. When you um, uh, brush it out with water, it becomes very, very pale. Uh, there's a new color from Windsor Newton called transparent yellow. It looks very, very dark um, when you first um, squeeze it out. But when you brush it out with water, it becomes this beautiful golden um, yellow that's really very lovely. If the color is is um, transparent and it has a dark mass tone, and remember most colors that are transparent have a dark mass tone, the mixture that you can make will exceed the value of either one of those colors by itself. So that means that you have endless blacks that you can make already on your palette. So I don't like the way that the store-bought blacks uh, dry. They dry to a matte finish, so I tend to make my own. use this, this large brush. The synthetic brushes will absorb and release less liquid than the natural brushes. So they're also better tools for scrubbing. I would only scrub with white synthetic. These white synthetics and that brush was white at one time. Um, or if you were to look at them under a microscope, what you'd see is it's just a simple monofilament. It's going to be smooth. If you were to look at this brush here, a scepter gold, which is a golden sable, each one of these hairs is going to have a micro etch, which means that a comparably sized uh, brush of this material is going to absorb and release liquid more readily than this. Uh, when it comes to the Kalinsky sables, they're going to have these little quills that are going to be on the hairs, which is going to create an enormous amount of surface area, which means that it's going to absorb and release liquid uh, much more readily and much more gently, which is going to allow you to glaze endless layers of color as long as you're correcting for the amount of water that's on there. Um, you can paint forever, um, just continue to glaze without picking up the paint that's already down there. I'm using is Thalo PB15. This relatively dark blue that I'm putting down in the water is going to be the value of the reflection of the clouds in the finished demo. These last couple brush strokes, what I've done is wipe off the excess paint because I know I'm getting to the end of the application. I'm going to have enough paint down but not too much. setting up and drying, I'm going to turn my attention back to the clouds for a little bit.
everything in a painting is relative. So if I want to create the illusion of something being bright, I need, and something being dark, I need something in the middle, middle value. from a photograph, although there is the reproduction of the painting right here. I'm just painting. So how do you decide what colors you want to use? Um, since I, I've been painting in Bermuda since 1982, so I have a palette of colors that um, I, I go to. And so, um, you know, I know what I'm going to be using for my uh, for my aqua blues, I know what I'm going to be using for my sky blues, um, and um, so, and I have a brush in my hand every day, so I've been painting since I was just a little kid, so it's just basically from experience. things um, happened. The thing that, ju that just happened is I didn't make the um, sky look uh, significantly uh, darker, but I did make these little white areas here um, look um, a little brighter. things that's happened is that a moment ago the land mass off in the distance the far end of the sound um, this mass right here looked fairly noticeable but as I've started to put more color into the sky it's becoming um, lighter and lighter so I'm going to need to put a little more color on there But I think you might be able to see that even now, we're beginning to get a sense of light and depth in the painting, even though we really haven't done very much yet. Screen. I want to see if you can see this tiny little pin dot of white that's right at the edge where the, this uh, bit of land is coming into this land here. We have to get rid of that. Any um, unintended highlight like that is going to be as visible in your finished painting as any intended highlight. So I eliminate that little spot right there. It eliminates confusion. While this is setting up a little bit more, I'm going to come back and soften this cloud a little bit more. And I just take that paint that I've activated and then just distribute it down into the body of the cloud. I think I'm going to have a little whisk come off the cloud right there. It's indicating that there's a little teeny bit of wind shear up there.
you might notice that I keep turning the board upside down and sideways. That's because I want to keep the tip of the brush to whatever the critical edge happens to be as the painting is progressing. So I'm constantly um, rotating the board, sometimes tilting it more or less, um, but always having it tilted at least a little bit. This is more of the thalo blue. Thalo blue comes in, thalo um, colors, like uh, the quinacridones, are colors that um, don't originate as a heavy metal or an iron oxide. They uh, are a separate category of paints that come from coal tar distillation. So if you've ever held a piece of coal in your hand and you twist it around and you see all those colors that are there, chemists had have uh, since about, um, 1860 or so, maybe a little earlier than that, have uh, figured out ways to extract those uh, colors, isolate them, and make them um, into paint. They were uh, made through a process called the lake process. And a lot of people have grown to think of the lake process as a pejorative term. And um, that's because the, um, a lot of these lake paints were considered to be fugitive or not light fast. And, um, that was true, uh, but that wasn't because of the lake process, it was because of um, the materials that were being used as the color agents. At the time, what people were using were grasses, gamboge is tree sap, um, rose matter genuine is ground up um, roots from the matter plant. And um, so what chemists realized is that they could um, take that same process and start to use other materials. Paint is made from two basic materials. You've got your um, pigment and, like I said earlier, your vehicle. Um, these colors originate as dyes. We don't make paint from, from dyes, we make paint from pigment. And so what chemists realize is that they can dye an inert material, alumina, and um, have a very tiny little pigment particle size. And what that produces is a very luminous um, paint. So any of your paints that come from um, coal tar distillation are going to be um, transparent, and they're going to um, allow an awful lot of light to penetrate. So, I don't know what that means, but when I try and mix it with other colors, it comes out like yum. So I'd have to I'd have to see what's on the um, the the back of the tube to see what the actual um, paint is. Um, it could be a compound color, or it could be some variation of phthalo um, bloom. Um, when phthalo blue was first introduced, there were three forms of it. One was PB15, one was 16, and one was 17. Uh, 16 and 17 were thought not to be as light fast and were removed from market for a while. Um, in recent years, they have been uh, re returned to the market. Um, there's also something called um, phthalo turquoise, which actually is a mixture of two colors. So I have to see what's on the back of the tube to see what they're calling because the, the name that they're giving you is just an arbitrary name. The thing that happens with these paints, cerulean blue is a real name for a real paint. It's, it comes from a heavy metal. Um, then you've got your natural iron oxides, your, your ochres, your uh, siennas, your umbers, things like that. And then you've got this category of paint here. And that can be almost an endless uh, variation of color that you can have um, in there.
setting up, I'm going to turn my attention back to the clouds one more time. Does anybody have any questions? That, they're just indicating where I'm going to be um, putting the reflection of the cloud in the water. Are you going to be able to erase them later? I won't have to because the value of the paint will exceed the value of the line, so it'll just magically disappear on its own. Do I have that margin pencil? Pardon? Do I have that magic pencil or do I have to go to Jerry's? You don't have to. Just a, an F grade pencil will magically do it all on its own. Okay. What happens is if, if the paint, um, if the value of the paint exceeds the value of your line, that just you, you can't see it. It'll be s still there, but you just won't be able to see it. I never worry about erasing. It's a combination of um, cadmium yellow and nickel titanate lemon yellow. Nickel titanate lemon yellow, PY53, is um, titanium oxide um, with some color in it. It is as opaque as any color that you can put down on your uh, palette. I'm going to put that right there, and it gives the, um, it goes on top of that, uh, that green and is allowing me to have a little yellow house on top of that green. Can you repeat that name? Nickel titanate lemon yellow PY53. When you're looking on the back of the tube, if you're looking at your cadmiums, there may be some confusion because um, cadmium yellows are either going to be uh, PY35 or PY37. They are functionally identical. If you've ever been to Bermuda, the wispy little trees that they have all over the island are casuarina trees. It was a cedar blight caused by the Americans, of course. Um, when, um, during the Second World War, um, people would be um, bringing supplies over to the bases that we had over there, and they found that there were beetles in the supplies, and those beetles got onto the island and uh, decimated the cedar trees. So what was replaced were um, these casuarina trees. They grow everywhere. They grow in rocks. They can grow, they don't need much of anything. So those little wisps that I was just doing right there were the top of the casuarina trees. Adding a little sepia to that um, hooker's green that I put down before.
with these colors, now that I'm beginning to layer them, what's going to happen is, sorry, each time I layer the color, each time I layer the color, there's going to be a multiplier effect that's going to happen. What's going to happen is that I layer two layers of color, I get three effects. I get the effect of each layer of, of, of glaze that I just put down, but where they overlap gives me a third effect. And that multiplier effect over time is going to be what begins to create that illusion that these marks wind up looking like ripples in, in the water. Notice that I am using my finger as a stop so that I'm making sure that I just get enough uh, water on the brush, not too much. The key to doing this technique successfully is water control. With time and practice, what will wind up happening is that you will have muscle memory. You'll be able to determine how much water and material is on your brush just as you're dipping into the um, palette. One of the things I think you can see is that the, the color and light is beginning to emerge in the painting already, and we really haven't done very much. color that I'm grabbing right now is chrome oxide green, PG-17. It is not chrome green. Chrome green is a mixture of Prussian blue and gamboge and is poisonous. Or not, um, not gamboge, it's um, um, chrome yellow. Well, quinacridone gold, the people who make, paint manufacturers don't make um, pigment. Pigment manufacturers make pigment, and typically they make it for industry. I mean, think about how little actual pigment the whole watercolor industry is, is using relative to, say, the auto industry. So um, what happened was they, uh, they stopped making the pigment right after quinacridone gold got to be really, really popular. And I realized this was happening and uh, quickly went to Daniel Smith and ordered about uh, four or five boxes of uh, quinacridone gold. Um, they said, you don't have to do it. We've got a lifetime supply. Yeah. Famous last words, about 24 months later, they were running out themselves. Another example of how everything is relative in a painting, if I put this mixture that I've just put together on this dark, it reads as a, um, a highlight. If I put it in here, it reads as a dark. Highlight, dark. Um, the other thing about the um, chrome oxide green is um, a lot of people don't like it because it's, you know, it's dull and, and opaque, but I, I think it has very good uses. Um, when you make uh, viridian, the way you make viridian is to take chrome oxide green and roast it in a furnace, and it turns into viridian. In fact, that's furnace um, colors. Anything that says that it's a burnt color is a furnace color. So burnt umber is a roasted form of raw umber. Burnt sienna is a roasted form of um, raw sienna. And there are lots of other colors that are available to the artist um, that are furnace colors.
that volume of paint that I just mixed, I felt was, um, had too much water in it. So that's why I tapped my brush to the paper towel for a second. The paper towels that I like using most for watercolor painting are Bounty. Uh, don't like those things that they have at school that are in the, um, the washrooms. They don't absorb anything and if you try and rub them on your paper, you'll scratch the paper. that's beginning to happen that I want to draw your attention to is the, um, the blue that I put down initially up in the sky. If you remember when I first put it down, it really, really looked dark. But the more that I'm working into the water, the lighter this is beginning to appear. That is once again an optical illusion. You're looking at the paint when compared to a vast amount of white paper and thinking, ah, oh, that's Maybe this is going to be too dark. But what you have to realize is that, one, the value is going to shift um, physically when it dries, and two, it, the value is going to shift perceptibly um, relative to the other colors and values that are on your uh, painting. So um, I actually had done a demonstration one time up in Staten Island where I put the color down about this much, and a woman in a kind of a stage whisper said to her friend in the front row, I think he messed it up already. <laughs> The other thing that might be an important takeaway from this demonstration is how much paint you actually need. I've squeezed out this thalo blue. This will be the third time. It's another reason why these M gram paints in the 15 milliliter <laughs> tubes are a good idea. Do you always use fresh paint? No, as a matter of fact, um, I leave the paint on the palette and I tell my students at the Pennsylvania Academy, go downstairs, don't clean your palette, go downstairs and buy another one of these palettes. They're $3.25. You're going to wash off $15 worth of paint just trying to clean your palette. Do you cover them with that press and seal content? I don't, but a lot of my students do. I just. What can you say? I've got my habits. If you were to come into my studio, um, what you would see is that I've got between a half dozen and eight of these larger palettes and, um, and then some other various palettes that are kicking around. I've got palettes that are predominantly for blues and greens some that are for the iron oxides, some that are for um, reds, some that are for yellows. And I just keep remixing the paint. And you always wear a white shirt? I don't always wear a white shirt. <laughs> it did occur to me on the way up, perhaps that was not the best color to select for today. Oh, it would look good with some blue. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, accidents do happen. And uh, last year when I was demonstrating on the beach in Bermuda with these M. Graham paints, I didn't realize that my finger had gotten um, into some of the, um, the paint. And I went and rubbed my hand through my hair. And suddenly the class started snickering. And I was like, what are they laughing at? And they said, here, let me show you. And a woman pulled out a mirror. So <clears throat> basically I had green hair. Well, I went into the ocean and had it washed down.
The next thing that I'm going to do is going to make this blue, which currently looks dark, look relatively light. I'm grabbing some sepia. We were talking about the fact that um, I don't endorse the colors. Um, every, every brand has a couple colors that I would recommend that you stay away from. And the uh, color that I would recommend you stay away from from Windsor Newton um, is uh, sepia. Their sepia, when it dries up, um, can clump up and when you go to reactivate it, it'll be stuck into your brush and when you bring it across the paper, you'll get skips. The other color that I would not endorse is, um, how, how many people use Opera Rose? Anybody? I would recommend that you give it to somebody you don't like because it's completely <laughs> fugitive. Permanent Rose, P PV19, Permanent Rose, and Permanent Rose is a, is a uh, name that Windsor Newton uses. Everybody else calls it Quinacridone Rose, PV19. And um, Opera Rose, there are two forms of PR122. One is a perfectly good color to use. One is a completely fugitive color. But just know that Opera Rose is a fugitive color. Fugitive as in it will disappear um, when exposed to just the least little bit of light. While that dries for a second, I want to point out something. These new color uh, charts that they have from Windsor Newton, they have why were these new colors um, introduced? And it will say it extends the range. The only thing that it extends is the range of profit for Windsor Newton. These are colors you do not need. Well, see, the thing is, with Payne's Gray, Payne's Gray was, was a color that, that was by a guy named Payne. He mixed up some color, and he decided that he was going to call it Payne's Gray. And, um, and at the time, it was Prussian blue and uh, yellow ochre and some kind of fugitive red. These days, different companies mix up different things, but it's usually between three and four different colors. So there are different recipes depending on the brand. If the colors in the, in the mixture are fugitive, then the mixture is going to be fugitive. This is one of the reasons why um, I like to stick with single pigment paints. It's, it's not the only reason, but the more that you uh, stick with the single pigment paints, the more control you're maintaining as you're going through the process. And uh, and you know, the, then you've got to be looking for the real names of the real paints. Um, yellow ochre is the real name for a real paint, but unfortunately, um, there are substitute colors that are um, sold as yellow ochre. Um, yellow ochre is PY43. It um, has a, a medium mass tone, it dries to a matte finish, and it is um, opaque. Um, Mars yellow, PY42, is a perfectly good color, it's just not yellow ochre. And it's cheaper than yellow ochre, so sometimes it's sold as yellow ochre. Sometimes, if you've ever bought something called golden ochre, then you've bought Mars yellow. Is alizarin crimson still considered fugitive? It is considered fugitive. It is absolutely considered fugitive. Um, PR83 is a fugitive color. And so if you want to use something that uh, behaves like alizarin crimson, use what Winsor Newton calls permanent alizarin crimson. It's going to be PR206, and um, it will be a much more stable color. Having said that, any of the colors that come from chemistry are not going to be as bulletproof as paints that come from heavy metals and come from 
uh, iron oxides. And incidentally, those colors that come from heavy metals and iron oxides are going to be some of your most expensive paints. Think I could get any darker than that? <laughs> now those last couple marks that I made will fade quite a bit and then Because that whole area is pretty damp right now, I am going to turn my attention back to the clouds just one more time. Also, do you have a preference? Uh, no, um, I, I, I've been painting um, cityscapes for, um, God, since I was in my early 20s, I guess. Um, I, I do portraits, I do, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, I went to school at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, so if you're in the middle of the city, there's a lot of inspiration. It's like, why don't I just paint what's down the street? And people started responding to them. There is Hooker's Green, and I, I began by putting a little bit of the sepia.
while this dries. One of the other things that I keep in my paint box are a couple pairs of pliers. I find that um, having one that grabs the top of the tube and one for the cap will keep you from tearing your, your tubes and ruining the paint. I keep a pair of scissors in there. I keep a utility knife, not an exacto knife. I find the utility knife is much um, easier to use. The exacto knife um, can break and splinter, and I don't find that it's a very good tool to use. come in with some more of the sepia and what's happening is as you're looking at this scene you're looking out across the vast um, sound and then um, as you're getting closer to the bottom basically what you're seeing is um, you're seeing underneath the sound. What's happening is that at times the water is going to act like a mirror reflecting what's around it and other times it's going to act like a window revealing what's underneath more readily. Yeah, we're, we're just about done. I'm going to uh, do one or two more things and then we'll be finished. So what happens when light bounces off of this as we finish this up? What, what happens is as light bounces off of the, uh, through the water and hits this uh, coral limestone that you have there throughout Bermuda, um, it will pick up little glints of light. And I'm going to indicate that right now with this last technique. This has to be done on a completely dry paper. This is uh, that same color combination of the um, cadmium yellow and the nickel titanate lemon yellow. What you just get are these little moments of highlight that occur. Can you, can you repeat that color please? The cadmium, yeah, nickel titanate lemon yellow. It's PY53. Um, and then basically that's, that's it. Um, done? Yes.